y'all. Sure am happy to have you all here with us today and, and uh, join in fellowship, praising the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And um, we're doing a study on the spirit world. And we're going through this thing, looking at verse after verse, talking about right now we're laying a foundation for We're not even really talking about the spirit world yet. We're laying a foundation for it where I'm disidentifying what different kind of spirits there are from a biblical perspective. Amen? Amen? And so, the spirit world, folks, I've preached a lot of messages on the spirit world, and so far, the Lord, as the Lord has led me, there's not been a repeat. There is so much stuff to talk about in the spirit world. The spirit world is so much more real than this material world that we live in. This material world is temporal, that spirit world is eternal. And so as we study this thing, hopefully you're going to um, get a, a more realistic view of what that spirit world is all about. As I get ready to say this, I want you to be cautious about how you feel about it because Jesus said all this stuff that we see, this world's gone crazy. And all this stuff that we're seeing in this world right now, none of it should be taking us by surprise. Because Jesus told us that these things would happen. And Jesus told us how we should feel about it when these scary things in the world start to happen. He says, be not troubled, your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. He actually says, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. The Lord's coming back. There has never been a point in history. Now, I know that historically men have made all kinds of mistakes about eschatology, and eschatology is a scholar word. They always have to create these $15 words so that you can see how smart they are. Eschatology just means study of end times. That's what it means. And so when you look at eschatology throughout history, Men thought that we were at the end when Hitler was going around killing the Jews. This has got to be the end times. Well, they missed some major points back in that time period, and that is Israel had not become a nation yet, <laughs> and that was prophesied. As a matter of fact, back in that time period, the, the church world, if you will, the, the scholars that seemed to lead the Christians, they said that that was a spiritual thing, that there was no way that Israel would become a nation again. And then here comes 1948, and boom, Israel's a nation again. Huh, maybe God knows what he's talking about. And so we tend to spiritualize things with, that shouldn't be spiritualized. We've never seen a time in the history of the world where things were coming together like they're coming together right now. The Bible says... Um, be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. We need to be smart about how we look at things, amen? And that all ties into the spirit that we're, the spirit world and what we're living in. Turn in your Bibles right to the very first uh, verse of the Bible, because this is the first mention of spirit, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It's, the first, it, it's actually verse 2 where the, the word spirit is first used. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and I love God for a number of reasons I, I love God and when I say God I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ He is God the Bible says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were created by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made and if you drop down to about verse 14 it says and the Word became flesh God became flesh and dwelt among us. And the world didn't recognize it. And so one of the things I love about God, first of all, my salvation, the fact that He even... Listen, folks, if we were God, we wouldn't have given humanity a chance. No. If we were God, we would have wiped them out when they turned against us. But God is gracious. He's merciful. And I love Him. But I love the way He put His Word together. Uh, in the beginning, God. I mean, that just smacks almost every false religion. That one statement <laughs> smacks almost every false religion right between the eyes. Yes. In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular, and the earth. 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I don't think it's just a coinky dinky that the first mention of Spirit in the Bible is the Spirit of God. That's not just by chance, that's by design. There's so far in this study we've taught and listen we're going through all these different spirits that the bible identifies and to make it easier so that you're not flipping all over through your bible i'm just taking them in order so all you got to do is keep turning your bible deeper and deeper as we go into these spirits so that you can see uh i'm trying to make it as easy as i can for you so that you don't have to spend the whole service digging through your bible but we are going to look at a lot of bible and so far We've identified nine spirits. We've identified the Spirit of God, which is this first verse that we looked at. We identified familiar spirits. We identified there is a spirit of wisdom. And listen, some of these spirits have a dual application. There's a spirit of wisdom from God's perspective, but guess what? Satan is not an original individual. Satan is an imitator. And so while God has a spirit of wisdom that's a godly wisdom, guess what Satan has? Satan has a spirit of wisdom that's earthly wisdom. Yeah. Not good. And so uh, there's a spirit of jealousy. The spirit of the Lord. We saw the spirit of the Lord. And guess what? The spirit of the Lord is the same exact spirit as the spirit of God because they are one. They are one. Um, there's people that, probably one of the most common comments that, that we get is, People complain to me that I say Jesus is God the Father, and He is. He's God the Father, He's God the Son, and He's God the Holy Spirit. And some people, and some people struggle with that and say, how in the world can you come up with that? From the Word of God. Philip told Jesus, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus said, Philip, you've been with me this long and you haven't realized that if you see me, you've seen the Father. In a prophecy of Jesus coming to earth, it says, unto us a child is born, uh, and, it, and it goes on to say that he will be called the mighty, um, uh, the mighty counselor, the prince of peace, the everlasting father. Jesus is the everlasting father. That's the promise of him coming. So the spirit of the Lord, which is the same as the spirit of God, there's a sorrowful spirit. I don't know if you've ever, if this has ever happened to you. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to Lisa. But sometimes everything's just going right, and all of a sudden you just feel sad. About it. And you can't even put your finger on Why am I sad? It's a sorrowful spirit that's bugging you. So there's a sorrowful spirit, which is also, there's also a sad spirit. And those two are probably closely related. There's lying spirits. We saw, we looked at that. There's lying spirits, spirits that are going to tell you lies. And you know the son, the thing about Satan and his lying spirits? They're not in your face lying spirits. They're very subtle. Our first account of Satan says that he was the most subtle thing that God created. He's very subtle. He's been so patient lining things up to where they are today. He spent over, over 6,000 years getting things to the point where they are right now. He's patient. Of course, to us, 6,000 years seems like forever. But Satan, being an, an eternal being, 6,000 years is probably like five minutes. You know, the Bible says to God, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. Why would that be any different to any other being in the spirit realm? And so, uh, very, uh, so I've said this numerous times from the pulpit. And, I, and I'm going to say it again. You'll probably hear me say it a lot. And it's for your own good. You know one of the best teachers is repetition. <laughs> you hear something over and over and over again, it tends to stick. And let me tell you something. When the devil approaches you, he's not going to come with a little three-pronged pitchfork and a pointed tail and horns and a goatee. Goatees are not evil, folks. And a goatee. <laughs> he's going to come with a Bible. And he's going to come with spiritual insights and he's going to come in a very friendly convincing form and if you don't know your bible you're vulnerable you're vulnerable 
because what he's going to say to you in the form of a lying spirit is going to be very convincing. Yes. And and uh, the only way you can protect yourself is by delving into this word and knowing it. And so then we left off with there's the spirit of nations. Nations. And I don't think we fully exhausted that idea of the spirit of nations. You know, every nation has its own spirit. And um, the spirit of nations, I don't think that each nation has a spirit that is only for that nation. I think a spirit can be ruling several nations at one time. And right now I think there's a spirit of nations and, and this is opinion, so take it with a grain of salt. But I think there, that there's a spirit of nations that we see some commonalities throughout history in, the, in a short period of time, in a short span of time, probably within the last hundred years. We see some things happening in different nations that you go, well, wait a second. That same thing happened over here. That same thing happened over here. That same thing happened over here. There's a master plan, if you will, the rulers of this world are not presidents, kings, and queens. No. There's rulers of darkness. Uh, Paul said our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's principalities. It's powers in high places. That's our enemy. And so somebody listens, listening to me talk says, Oh, this preacher is a conspiracy theorist. That term is an interesting term. You know who coined that term, in my uh, opinion? Satan. Because the minute you throw out that term conspiracy theorist, you have disarmed the person that's trying to tell you maybe some truth. Now, I don't think everything that's come down the pike of conspiracy theories has been accurate. Not obviously, it hasn't been. But to say there's no conspiracies is being blind. It's being naive. Being foolish. What's foolish mean? Foolish doesn't mean stupid. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So when you say it's being foolish, it's ignoring God in the spiritual realm. The Bible talks about conspiracies. There's conspiracies going on. That you know what? That where the first conspiracy started? When Satan said, I will exalt my throne above the most high. There was a conspiracy going on to overthrow God's power and for another ruler. God, could you imagine if Satan could possibly win? Praise the Lord, he can't win that battle. But could you imagine if he could and did? Oh my gosh, it would be life would be terrible. Even not just this material life, but even in the spirit world. And so when Satan rebelled against God, God could have just said, that ends it. Boom, we're done. But God didn't do that. God could have just said, uh, Satan, you and that one third of the angels you took with you, you no longer exist. And he could have went on with the existing two thirds of the angels and two thirds of his creation. But he didn't do that. He had something to prove to the other two thirds. He had to prove that he's love. And Satan's hatred. Yeah. And so, in doing that, he created a world. And there is a battle that's taken place on this world for the souls of men. And God lined it up in a way that, that you know, when I was a kid, and, and things were a lot different when I was a kid than what they are today. But it wasn't common to say, I could whoop you with my arms tied behind my back. That wasn't an uncommon thing to say back when I was a kid. And uh, God's going to whoop Satan with his arms tied behind his back, his legs tied together, blindfolded, and, and he's still going to win. Because Satan's playing checkers and God's playing three-dimensional chess. And God's going to win this battle no matter what. And Satan, there's a, there's a lie that's been taught from churches for hundreds of years, and that is, Satan knows that he has but a short time. I don't believe that for a minute. 
You say, well, wait a second. The Bible says Satan's angry because he knows he has but a short time. Yeah, he realizes that in the middle of the tribulation, according to the Bible. Right now, he thinks he can win this thing. As a matter of fact, he looks at events in the world and he says, I am winning this thing. Yep. But when the middle of the tribulation comes and Satan sees all the prophecies that God has prophesied have come to pass, he's going to go, oh my gosh, my goose is cooked. <laughs> I'm going to lose. And he's going to know he has but a short time. And that's when the last three and a half years of the tribulation takes place where it's literally hell on earth. Satan's going to unleash his fury on all of God's creation. And um, so, as we looked at these nine spirits that we've already examined, and by the way, going back to national spirits, I want to talk about some of those similarities that I say I, makes me reach the conclusion that maybe one spirit's run in several different countries. Germany, in order to go after Poland, faked an attack on their soil to where they could say, hey, we lost troops because these, the Polish army attack, attacked us on the border, now we need to go whoop up on Poland. America's done that on a couple of occasions where we faked a attack on America in order for us to engage in war. Uh, the first that I'm aware of, and it's probably not the first, was Pearl Harbor. There's no way our intelligence didn't know that the Japanese were closing in on Pearl Harbor. Don't you find it interesting that the fleet that was in Hawaii was a fleet that was, cons the, the, the types of ships that were in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor at that attack were ships that were deemed obsolete in an arsenal. The major war machines were out at sea, where they wouldn't be sunk and killed. But they not only wanted Japan to attack us so we could engage in World War II, they wanted us to lose lives so that we'd get our rage stirred up. And so here's some of the common things you see in these fake wars. When the government is trying to become too intrusive on its population and the population starts to rebel and fight back, all of a sudden there's a catastrophe in that country that changes the people's focus from getting individual liberties to surviving. And national pride and patriotism. And so um, I'm going to say something that's going to be very unpopular right now. Netanyahu was in big, big political trouble. In Israel, there were, riot, not riots, but protests in the streets, hundreds of thousands of people deep. Now, you say, well, hundreds of thousands. Okay, that's a lot of people. You gotta get the significance of 100,000 people showing up in Israel. Israel's population is nine million. <laughs> One-tenth of the country showed up to protest. <laughs> Netanyahu was in political trouble. And what was he doing? He was trying to attack the Constitution of Israel and give himself more power and the legislation less power. They're not talking about Netanyahu. They're still talking about Netanyahu, but they're talking about how he allowed security. Listen, Israel, there's... How to say this without it sounding like I'm, and I'm not anti-Israel. I'm pro-Israel. Pray for the peace of Israel. I'm not necessarily pro Netanyahu because Israel's security is so intense. It's hard to fathom. I'm not going to say it's impossible. It's hard to fathom that a bunch of folks could breach their border, cut down their fences, and Israel's security have no knowledge that it was coming. It's hard to fathom that. They have on their fence around their country because did you know that Israel's only nine miles deep? If you walk nine miles, you've gone from one border of Israel to the other border of Israel, from the sea to the, um, the Arab border of Israel. Nine miles. It's smaller than New Jersey. They don't have a whole lot of land to defend. And so they put fence up around it because they know the whole Arab world wants to drive them off the face of the earth. And they have security cameras 
to where every inch of that fence is being watched by some soldier 24 hours a day. And yet, they were able to breach Israel's security. But see, they're not talking about Netanyahu trying to overthrow their constitution anymore. They're not talking about that anymore. And that's the spirit of nations. And that spirit of nations, the reason why it's similar is because it's guiding all nations into a one world government prophesied in the Bible. And so, if you want to do a really interesting story in regards to the eschatology that's taking place in Jerusalem right now, you know, in Israel right now, do a study on Gaza. Just look up Gaza in your Bible. Because the Bible says that Gaza is going to be wiped out. It's going to be total destruction. Uh, this whole talk about, you know, Israel did go in and bomb some places in Gaza. It ain't done. It's not done. And there may be a pause while other nations are pressuring Israel to say, wait until we get our uh, hostages back. They're not getting their hostages back. The only reason why there are only two hostages released for, to America was so that America would put pressure on Israel to hold off, giving them time to fortify, giving them time to get to their underground tunnel system and all that stuff. There was a reason behind all that. And so they're not going to release those hostages. And Israel's going to go in, and Gaza's going to be destroyed. <laughs> not just a few buildings toppled. That country is going to be destroyed by Israel. And then if this truly is, and I'm not saying this is the end time battles. If it is, uh, in doing research, we watched uh, an, an Israeli intelligent official, uh, we watched a documentary on, on this guy speaking about what's going on. And he said, what the world doesn't realize, when you're in a fight, whether it's a person against a person or whether it's a nation against a nation, it's the opponent that decides what level of violence is going to take place. Yeah. And he gave an example. He said, if you come to a fist fight and you think, well, we're just going to duke it out with our fists, and the other guy pulls out a knife, you now better figure out something better than fists in order to fight that enemy. And he said, you know, uh, uh, their enemy, Israel's enemy, wants them destroyed from the face of the earth. And he said a term that I haven't ever heard until I listened to him. He said, Israel's last resort is the Samson effect. What do you suppose the Samson effect is? Well, as Samson was captured by the Philistines and put in prison and his eyes were cut out, and all the Philistines were making sport of him. They brought him to an arena and all these Philistines were completely around this arena. And Samson said to the Lord, his hair had grown bad. Let me kill these Philistines with me. Let me kill my enemy. I'm going to die, but let me take my enemies with me. And he pushed the pillars out to the building and the building collapsed and killed all these Philistines as well as killing Samson. And he said, the Samson effect for Israel is we have the capability to wipe out our enemy, even though it means we wipe out us at the same time. Mm. So this guy said that America, who's probably Israel's strongest ally, the people in America in the coming weeks, because they're going to be so brutal in their attack of Gaza, that our loyalty to Israel is going to be challenged that our resolve that Israel has a right to, to defend themselves is going to be challenged. The world is, and I know that we're straying from the message, but this is, this is the spiritual battle that we're in today. And so they're going to be brutal in their attack on Gaza. They're going to be ruthless because their enemy's ruthless. And we're going to watch news reports. It's just a matter of time before the news media who bring, they're not really a news reporting agency. They are a brainwashing company. It's just a matter of time until the news media turns on Israel and starts talking about Israel as the bad guy and not the Palestinians. Yeah. I say pray for that entire region. Not every Palestinian is evil. Not every... 
Jew is good. <laughs> right. And pray God's the one that can sort that out. We can't. And so pray God's will be done over there. And eventually, um, as God's is going, according to the biblical prophecy, if this is the actual end times, you know what's going to happen? Every nation in the world, including America, is going to line up against Israel. Against Israel. Yeah. And they're going to go in to wipe Israel out. Is the Samson effect's never going to take place because the Bible doesn't make reference to them. In fact, Israel's going to be preserved. They're not going to wipe themselves out to wipe out their enemy. It's interesting that their mindset is set that way. That's not going to take place because when the world goes against Israel, according to biblical prophecy, God's going to intervene and God's going to deliver Israel. And the weaponry of the other nations is going to be ineffective against Israel. Hmm. And it talks about years and years of, of cleaning up the dead bodies all over this world when that battle takes place. And you know what? If you find a dead body, you're not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to, you're going to have to put some kind of a signal there and there's going to be trained people that go in there. And, sounds like radiation to me. There's going to be trained people that go in looking for these things where you mark, you found a bone. Even if you find one bone, you're not allowed to touch it according to biblical prophecy. you got to put a flag by it or some kind of uh, marker by it, and then somebody else is going to come and deal with it. And that's why it's going to take years to clean it up. Isn't that interesting? Spirit of the nations. Why is it that we see so many similarities? You, you saw recently where the people in Australia were riot like crazy and all of a sudden there's a traumatic thing takes place and people aren't talking about their freedoms or their liberties anymore they're focused on whatever that and we even had politicians so bold as to say don't waste a good catastrophe or don't waste a good emergency here's how we can take away rights from people and they'll accept it the spirit of nations and it's not that spirit of nations is not a good spirit I don't believe. I don't believe that there is a, an example of a good spirit of nations. You say, what about America being a Christian country? It's time for you to wake up. America has never been a no, Christian been. country. No. There's no such thing as a Christian. Christianity is an individual by individual thing. There is not a Christian nation. And so if you go back in true American history, was there a biblical influence as America was being founded? Absolutely. And that's what our history books is focused on, that biblical uh, backdrop of the founding of America. But did you know that Satanism was alive and well during the founding of America too? It's not a coincidence that in our capital, the Washington, D.C., the streets were laid out in the form of a pentagram. That's not, they, they didn't just lay out the city and go, oh my gosh, there's a pentagram in there. That was done by design. That was done by design. And so they say that George Washington was the father of America. And we've accepted that because our history books have told us that. I think if you go and do some studying, you can find probably a good argument to say that Sir Francis Bacon was the founder of America. <laughs> he was a Satanist. And it's not a coinky dink that of the signers of the Constitution. Boy, we're certainly getting off on that field, aren't we? All but one of them have been proven to be Masons. Now, Albert Pike, one of the lead Masons that brought Masonry over to America, Albert Pike was a Luciferian by his own admission. As a matter of fact, he said, if you're a Mason and you don't understand that we're a Luciferian organization, you don't know much about the organization. <laughs> Masonry is not good. Now, you talk to the average Mason, they don't know how evil that organization is. I'm not even sure that the 32 degree Mason knows how evil their organization is. I know that. I've done state studies on Masonry, and I know that the folks there's folks that are way high up in masonry to say the average mason thinks there's 32 degrees there's so many more than 32 degrees 
32 to the 32 degree is somebody that's initiated to the point that they could be invited into the next step. Scary stuff. So not only do, and I'm gonna leave that, I just wanna give you some food for thought and bear in mind because of the spirit of the times, another spirit, amen, because of the spirit of the times, you're going to see some changes around here. Some of them you'll probably like, some of them you may not like, but we're going to have to You say, why would anybody be interested in a little teeny church like this? Well, if those sleeper cells do get woke up in, in this world, in America, they're not going after the big churches, and I'll tell you why. Big churches have mega security systems with armed guards <laughs> and with... Uh, all kinds of systems in order to, to protect the folks within. They're going for small and medium-sized churches where the people are comfortable that we're not at risk. We're not at risk. One last thing on the spirit of nations. Don't you find it ironic that when most of these catastrophes happen, the security was at an all-time low way out of the ordinary for that country. Did you know that in this recent attack on Israel, they were down to about one-tenth of what their normal staffing is for their security when this attack took place? Did you know that in, in uh, um, you know, when 9-11 took place, don't you find it a very weird coincidence that they were having a military exercises of the Twin Towers being crashed into while the twin, twin Towers were actually being crashed into. That's too much of a coincidence for me to buy. And so the military didn't even think any of it was real till way late into the actual thing because uh, there's even recordings of folks saying, now is this an exercise or is this real? Because they were doing an exercise. Security had been breached. So we learn about some characteristics about spirits. We learn that a spirit can experience anguish. Anguish. And we learn that a spirit can be hardened. So those are a couple of things that we learned about character. And we're going to talk more about characteristics of spirits as we go on. But you're going to see that um, um, spirits can see. Spirits can hear. There's many characteristics about spirits. Um, as the spirit world is taking control of this world, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, YouTube and Facebook are censoring folks that are telling the truth. That has, that's a spiritual thing. And just a little bit that I said today, we may get our second warning from Facebook. <laughs> I mean, we've already been given one more, and they said two more, and we will never let you on Facebook again. And so folks on the internet, if you're watching us and you enjoy the messages and the truth that you can get here at Facebook, we disappear off Facebook, go to Rumble. We also post our messages on Rumble and Rumble to this point hasn't been censoring folks. And so to this point, that's probably going to change as the spirit gets more and more powerful. Yeah. So there are specific national spirits, which we talk about. Look at Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. Ezra. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. Ezra's right after Chronicles. Chronicles is a pretty good sized book. You should be able to find it. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Give me a chance to warm up my vocal cords. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in, also in writing, saying, and we're not going to go into that, but we talk about the spirit of a nation. Guess what? There's a spirit of national leaders. A spirit of national leaders. 
these national leaders, they're not necessarily interested in the well-being of their population. They're being guided by a spirit. And some of that's good spirits and some of that's bad spirits. The Bible says that God controls the uh, heart of a king like the banks of a river control a river. Now, sometimes a river overruns its banks. Amen? And so when the Bible gives me that analogy of God controlling the heart of the king like the river banks control a river, that king can probably over, because God gave us all a free will, right? right? Including those kings. And so God may put a boundary for a king's heart and the king may overrun that boundary because of their own desire to do their own will. And so uh, you have this spirit of national leaders. So not just nations, but also the leaders of nations. That puts us in a conundrum if you stop and think about it. Especially if the spirits that are, that are running the nations and the spirits that are running the leaders of the nations you want to know why we're going to end up in a one world government? How that can even happen when you've got all the egos and all the, the power grabbing of all these world leaders that want to have power and they want to con control their country? And incidentally, the solution to America's problem is not Donald Trump. It's not Joe Biden. It's not any other politician anywhere in the world. The only solution for America is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so um, they're all power hungry. They all want power. So how, when all these leaders want power, how are they going to acquiesce their power to a one world leader? It's because they're being guided by a national spirit and a spirit of national leaders. And that spirit's going to tell that national leader, let so-and-so take over. We'll take care of you. You'll still have power. You'll still have might. You'll still have strength. You'll still have money. You'll still have all the things that you strive for. And if you don't think money plays a role in it, you're naive. Because the Bible says the love of money, we talked about this in Sunday school, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the root of all evil. And so uh, money is going to have uh, um, an impact on this whole thing. And these folks will acquiesce to a one world leader. And if you take biblical prophecy, and I know that I'm not given Bible to support all these things, you can go in and research it and see it's true, because right now I'm just talking about spirits. And we're going to eventually get to the spirit of Antichrist. We're not there yet. But... The Antichrist, when they show up on the scene, it's a horn that appears. So it's not visible right now. I believe that the Antichrist right now is alive and well in this world, and I believe that he's politically involved, but we don't know who he is. So this stuff saying, well, it's Obama, that's nonsense. It can't be Obama because Obama's already been identified, right? right. It's not Trump. It's not, I hear people saying it's not Yahoo. No, it's not. It's not somebody that we know right now. There's somebody that just recently popped up that maybe it could be, and I'm not saying it is him. What's that prince's name? Do you remember? No. A prince in Saudi Arabia that just showed up on the scene saying, I can fix this problem in between Israel and the Palestines. If he can, he's the guy. <laughs> Whoever can fix that problem is going to be super powerful. That problem's been going on for over 8,000 years. That problem's been going on forever. You know why? Because when Abraham had Isaac, who did he have before Isaac? By the bondwoman, he had Ishmael. And so all the promises made to Abraham, the descendants of Ishmael, say those are our promises. They were met. Ishmael was the firstborn those belong to us. And all the descendants of Isaac say, that was the bond woman, we're the free woman, those promises belong to us. The three major religions that are at odds with each other are Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And you know what those three religions have in common? 
their root is Abraham. And so you have Christians saying, God's done with Israel, he's not. If you, if you think God's done with Israel, you don't know your Bible. God's done with Israel, those promises are now ours. That's, Christians are saying that all over the world. Jews saying, nobody else matters, those promises are to us. And Islam, which is what, where Ishmael's family comes from, Islam is saying, Temple Mount is ours. We need the entire East Bank. That whole east, eastern part of Israel is only nine miles wide. What do you want to do? Cut it in half and make it four miles wide? It's ridiculous. But this prince from Saudi Arabia, and I don't remember his name, but he came out publicly and said, the Palestines are wrong. The Palestinians are wrong. That land was given to Israel by God Almighty. And he's already working it, putting a peace agreement between Israel and those folks. It's not going to happen anytime soon because the Bible says Gaza is going to be destroyed. So if this war ends before Gaza is destroyed, we're not right at the end times yet because the Bible says Gaza is going to be destroyed. So there's some things for you to mark down in your little thought of eschatology and what's going on from this point forward. So God's spirit is referred to as a good spirit. So there's good spirits. Good spirits. Good spirits. You notice as I write, my writing gets sloppier and sloppier. Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 20. Nehemiah is right after Ezra. Just keep turning back. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 20. Nehemiah 9 20. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. So God himself is a good spirit, but he also has good spirits that work for him. Uh, so we have prophets of nations, prophets of national leaders. There's good spirits. And while we're right there in Nehemiah, there's also the spirit of the prophets. Spirit of the prophets, drop down to verse 30. You're in Nehemiah 9, drop down to verse 30. Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by the Spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. You know what is common throughout history is history keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. And so you have um, true prophets in the time, last days of the dispensation of the law where Israel... You know how you got saved in the, not in the entire Old Testament, but the last dispensation before us, the dispensation of the law? You got saved by following the law. <laughs> you had to convert to Judaism. You had to bring your, uh, your uh, sacrifice for your sins to the altar. And if you didn't do that, you weren't saved. And if you doubt that, just look up this phrase. Go to your concordance and look up this phrase. Salvation is of the Jews. <laughs> You had to become a Jew during the dispensation of the law. Salvation is of the Jews. Prior to the law, your conscience, if you violated your conscience, you had to... you know when the first sacrifice was instituted to mankind? When Adam and Eve sinned. Yeah. And from that point forward, men knew there had to be a blood sacrifice for their sins. That's why you have uh, Cain and Abel... Uh, Abel brought the appropriate sacrifice, a lamb. How did he know that? Because God instituted it. And uh, Cain brought his uh, fruits and vegetables that he raised as a sacrifice, and God wouldn't accept the fruits and vegetables. Yeah. That's where we get the term, you can't get blood from a turnip. Every, every phrase that mankind has used comes from this book. Yeah. Can't get blood from a turnip. 
And so God rejected Cain's. And so what happens? Cain comes walking into the field and he sees his brother Abel whose sacrifice was accepted. And Abel sitting there with his flock of sheep and he's singing. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. And oh, oh uh, Cain looks at him and goes, that's self-righteous such and such and so and so. He thinks he's holier than thou. The lost world still looks at us that way. Yeah, they do. Oh, that preacher over there, he's self-righteous. He really thinks he's something. He thinks he's the only preacher left in America. No, I don't. I don't think I'm the only preacher left in Colorado, let alone America. <laughs> but most preachers are bad. The world has gone to apostasy. And what, as I'm talking about, history repeats itself over and over again. In the end of the law, the Jews quit listening to the prophets of God. And they'd say things like, well, I don't believe, blah, 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 blah. Well, I don't feel, blah, 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 blah. What do you have going on in Christianity today? A preacher preaches the truth and people in the congregation go, well, I just don't believe blah, 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 blah. And I just don't feel blah, 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 blah. And yet, to follow God, it's thus saith the Lord. It doesn't matter what you think, how you feel about it. Women cannot be preachers. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. A woman shall not usurp authority over a man, and a preacher usurps authority over the entire congregation. I don't like that, preacher. Well, your problem is you don't listen to God. Not that you don't listen to me, because I didn't say that. My own self, personally, I'd be okay with women preachers. I think women are pretty smart. But God said no. And so, you know that bumper sticker? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Yeah. That bumper sticker is stupid because that middle phrase doesn't even belong there. God said it. That settles it. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Amen. Okay. Amen. God said it. That settles it. Wow, that Bible is just an old archaic book that is. It was written by man, and and I can show you so much evidence that this book wasn't written by man. I can give you 50 lessons just in biblical numerology that you go, there's no way they could have done that. No way men could have got together and made that happen. There's another false teaching that says that Bible, God gave men the basic concept and they showed their own personality and how they wrote whatever it was God said. No, God told them, Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 12, I want you to write this. Moreover, get that down. Moreover, thou, get that down. Let us, get that down. He dictated to him word for word exactly what to say. Because men in their own personality couldn't have, even if they tried to, couldn't have come up with the numerology that proves the Bible was written by God. Mm -hmm. And you have Paul saying, uh, words to the effect, this is a huge paraphrase, but I thank God for you because when I came to you, you took the word of God as what it is, the word of God and not of man. We have the word of God. Yeah. God said that he had preserved his word, so his word is preserved. And it's not preserved in 450 different versions. That's no, no, not... You know, the Bible says there's one spirit, one baptism, one God, and 450 Bibles. No, one Bible. One Bible. Amen, amen. I don't like that, preacher. Go argue with God. <laughs> Your argument's not with me. I'm just the mailman. I just deliver the, the mail. <laughs> God's the one that sent it, right? So there's individual spirits for each and every one of us. We all have our own spirit. So each, and, and I'm not saying that, just to give an example, Larry and I may have the same spirit. But there, it's individual to him and it's individual. I'm not saying that, like if there's seven billion people, there's seven billion spirits, each one having his own spirit. That's not what I'm saying, but there's individual spirits. Individual.
individual spirits. So, <clears throat> look at Job chapter 10, verse 12. Just keep going back in your Bible. Job chapter 10, verse 12. It says, Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. So that could be talking about a spirit that each individual has, but it also could, and in this case, it would be that Larry has his own spirit, I have my own spirit. And it could just be talking about our personal spirit. We have our individual spirit. I am a body. That's the world way of thinking. I am a soul, a spirit, and a body. And so I have my individual spirit, each one of you. If you're lost, your spirit is dead. That's why when yeah. Paul says, ye hath he quickened who were dead in your trespasses and sin, that means quickened doesn't mean he made you run faster. Quickened means that he brought back to life. You hath he brought back to life who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, you say, well, wait a second. I wasn't dead. Your spirit was. Yeah. And when you got saved, your spirit was made back to life and your body spiritually died. Paul says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And we're going to get a new body. This body's dead. Yeah. You say, I don't get that. That's because it's spiritual. And the Bible says that a person can't understand things that are spiritually discerned unless they have the Spirit of God showing them things. And so, um, I remember one time, and we're going to close with this, and we'll pick up next week. We still have a lot of spirits to talk about. We're not even close to the bottom of it. But I remember one time, Lisa's going to start laughing as soon as I say it, but she knows this story very well, but I was on a um, team in business where there were three different teams and we were saving. The, I, I retired from a major corporation as a senior executive and, and there were three different teams and we were running around saving. My team saved the company $143 million in one year. And so um, one of the other team leaders contacted me and said, I want you to come and talk to me. Meet me at this location. So I went to meet him at that location. Didn't know what it was about, but he said he wanted to talk to me. So I went and met him. He didn't know that I was a preacher. <laughs> he was a Mormon. And he said to me, he said, I called you here because I want you to I want to ask you, did you notice that you're the only leader on this thing that's not a Mormon? I said, yeah, I noticed that. And then he went on to talk to me about how he became a Mormon, and, he, and it started with him knowing that the Trinity cannot be true. And I said, what do you mean the Trinity cannot be true? He said, there's no way that three things could be three separate things and be one thing. I said, really? What about an egg? As a shell, a white and a yolk, you could separate the shell over here, you can put the white right here, and you put the yolk right here. It's still an egg, yeah. but it's three different things. And what about a fire? A fire is heat, fuel, and oxygen. Three separate things, but the three together make a fire, and if you take any one of them away, the fire will go out, because it requires those three things. The sun puts off three different types of rays. One that can be seen and not felt. One that can be felt and not seen. And one that can be neither seen nor felt. Actonic rays. God set up this universe to confirm the Trinity. Everything is done in threes. Everything yes. is done in threes. Yes. You have a soul, a body, and a spirit. And if you're saved, the body says that God gave you an operation made without hands where he went in and separated the body from the soul and the spirit. And so Paul says, when I sin, it's no longer me that sins. It's this body. It's sin that dwells in this body. And this body's being left behind. I'm getting a new body. A sinless body. One that's never sinned. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Now listen, in closing, I want to make this one last statement. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to do that. Anybody who, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And if you've never come to the Father by Jesus Christ, 
no matter what you've done to get to the Father, it didn't work. You have to go through Jesus Christ. And you say, well, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us exactly how you do that. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Two things have to happen. You have to confess with your heart, with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart. Those two things have to happen. And so when it, the Bible says confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't say confess that you're a sinner. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say uh, um, confess that you're undone, confess that you're going to hell. All that stuff's true, but that's not what the Bible says. It says you've got to confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's saying, in essence, not just that Jesus is Lord, but that Jesus is now my Lord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus yeah. is my God. Yeah. Amen. You do that, and it doesn't even take a prayer. It takes you doing something with your mouth, Yes. A prayer doesn't save you. Confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that saved you. That's my word. You say, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. My Baptist preacher told me, go with what the Bible says, not with you. Listen, I was a Baptist preacher. This is a non-denominational church, but I was a Baptist preacher for years. Go with what the Bible says. You do that, you're saved. You're saved. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, man, I need your help in, in trying to convey the things about this spirit world, Lord. Um, the spirit world is something that we don't see. And yet it's there, and we know that it's there, and we know that it's more real than our life. And so, God, we need your help, both in understanding and in teaching and having scales removed from our eyes, false perceptions that we might have held on to for years. And God, we just need your help as we continue on in this series. And Lord, I pray that what's been taught today, that people will think about it, that they won't just discard it, but that they'll think about it, meditate about it, pray about it, compare it to what your word says, Lord. And God, I pray if there's anybody that at any time, because of this being posted on the internet, I pray if there's anybody at any time that hears this message that hasn't confessed you as their God and have, doesn't believe that you rose again, that today would be the day of their salvation. Your word says, now is the appointed time, but oh, today is the day of salvation. Shouldn't be put off. Lord, we just pray that you'd lead folks into coming to you. We praise you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.